Okay, folks, welcome back from your mid-semester break. I hope you had a relaxing time doing your peer reviews and catching up on the optics notes. We are six of 11 lectures through the optics subunit. We're about halfway or 30 pages through the optics notes. Uh, if you haven't caught up, now's a good time to do it. So uh, don't waste any time. It's really in your interest to follow along with the notes as we go through the lectures. Any administrative questions before we get started? Okay. So we've got a couple of things to finish off with um, opti uh, Gaussian beams before we continue on to the next topic in the optics subunit. And to dust the cobwebs off after mid-semester break, we'll just have a look at what we got up to uh, in week nine. So we got to the point of deriving this result of the full Gaussian beam amplitude function. Uh, it contains its amplitude and its phase, because it's a complex function. We had the total beam power described by psi naught. The fact that we have, must conserve energy as the beam expands gives us a decreasing amplitude. Uh, spherical wave fronts of radius Rz. Near the origin, these wave fronts are infinite intensity. They're plane waves. And as we get further out, R of Z becomes uh, more like a spherical wave. There was also this weird Goy phase shift. This was this amazing topological result which said that if we admit that the wave looks like a spherical wave in the far field, but realize that it's only going in one direction because it's a beam, it can't be a spherical wave exactly because spherical waves go both directions or all directions from the origin. So we've got to have a pi phase shift as we go through focus. And finally, this transverse amplitude profile. In other words, the spot we see when we shine a laser beam or a bright dot of light. We describe the beam in terms of these two parameters, the um, real radius of curvature R of Z and the waste or the beam radius W of Z. These formed uh, different bits of the complex radius of curvature Q and we chose to represent the real and imaginary parts in this funny way here. The characteristic length over which the beam changes shape, this is just a convenience symbol, ZR, is the Rayleigh range. It tells us the distance over which the spot size will increase by a factor of root 2 and over which the intensity will go down by a factor of 2. So when the beam gets half as bright from an intensity point of view. And I encourage you to try and show this from the, um, from the formula uh, for the Gaussian beam. These are the two functions when we went through all the gory details of how to actually go from an explicit form for Q of Z and this expression for its uh, real and imaginary components, it allowed us to derive what W of Z and R of Z were. And we found that indeed the waste looks like something that starts off quite flat and then gets broader. That's what we plotted last time. And the wavefront radius of curvature is quite simple as well. For very small values of Z, so close to the waste, you can see which of these two terms dominates. It's this one here. This term is big, and that means that we get a diverging radius of curvature, which describes the plane wave nature of the beam near the waist. For much bigger Z, when Z's much, much bigger than ZR, this term is vanishing, and this term dominates. And then the expression for the radius is just the distance from the waist itself, which is exactly what a spherical wave is. Its radius of curvature is the distance from the origin. I got a great question from Jess after lecture six, and he asked, where do Gaussian beams come from? That's not exactly what he said, but that's my paraphrasing of it. Or where do they start and where do they end? We've got this nice picture in our minds now, and in the notes, of what the wave fronts look like. They're described by the uh, flat and curved lines here, and the waist itself, the beam size, described by the, um, the bounding curves of that, of that diagram. But where do we actually make this beam? Where did it come from? Well, any kind of beam that looks like a blob can be, or any beam at all, can be decomposed into these Laguerre Gauss modes. And for anything that looks mostly like a blob, this one that we've been studying, the TEM00, or lowest order Gaussian mode, will dominate. So if you know, if you've made a beam of some description from a laser or a light bulb, uh, you will have some spot size. And you can say, well, we know the spot size of the Gaussian beam, now all we need is the wavefront curvature, and we'll be able to uniquely determine the, uh, the Gaussian beam. This, of course, works better with an example. Uh, so here's an example. It is protected by an energy shield, which is generated from the nearby forest moon of Endor. So in the case of this energy shield, you can see that um, on the moon of Endor, there's plane waves at the surface, 
You can't actually see that, but you can imagine them being plane waves at the surface because these um, tangent lines to the beam waste, which I'm going to take as a solid yellow line there, are kind of flat. And this uniquely determines the Gaussian beam that we've got coming off the surface. We've got uh, a spot size, which is roughly the size of that yellow circle, and planar wave fronts, which then start to become curved. That's where the beam starts, wherever we like. Where does the beam end? Well, it's when it hits the Death Star 2 and interacts with something. We're not going to worry about the details of that, light-matter interaction. Uh, if the Death Star 2 wasn't there, that would just propagate as a Gaussian beam ad infinitum and become a spherical wave in the far field. If there was some curvature to the wave front at the surface, then that would dictate, or that would be uniquely ascribed by a different Gaussian beam. But the point is that you can um, manipulate a wave field however you like, as long as you know the spot size and the wave front curvature, you've uniquely determined the Gaussian beam. So it can start at the waist, as this one does on the surface, or it can start converging or diverging, however you like, depending on the, the device you've got. When we were studying ray optics, we used this um, matrix formalism to transform a ray from one place to another through an optical system. All was not lost, because we found that in the Gaussian theory, we can actually use the same matrices to transform the complex radius of curvature. But there's a catch. This is a complex number. It doesn't readily transform via a matrix. If I multiply a matrix by a complex number, I don't get out another complex number. So we instead had to use this ABCD rule, which uh, took a, one complex number QI before the Gaussian beam went into an optical system, and just used this algebraic expression uh, to find the complex radius of curvature after the, uh, the optical system. This was quite um, a powerful result. We motivated it by considering um, curvature of real wave fronts, but it holds for this complex radius of curvature too, which is pretty cool. It's not enough for us to just postulate that ABCD rule based on some, um, on some uh, real spherical waves. We also have to make sure that it's physical. And in this context, physicality means that if I've got two optical systems, I'm going to start off with a complex radius of curvature Q1. I can transform it to Q2 by this ABCD rule with M1. And then I can, in turn, transform that to Q3 using M2. That's fine. But we know something about how ABCD matrices are composed together when we have a composite optical system. We know that we can skip this middle step and just multiply M1 and M2 together. And that should give us Q3 in terms of Q1, where the new A, B, C, and D are the elements of the matrix product, M1 and M2. So this is going to be an assignment question where you actually have to show that this rule is well-defined uh, under composition. The first thing we're going to um, look at in our last two items for Gaussian beams is what this picture looks like. So we found this was the picture that motivated us to throw away the ray optics theory and realize that it predicted absurdities and use the wave theory. So at the end of the last lecture, I showed you this picture. This is what focusing a Gaussian beam looks like. We no longer have an infinite intensity at the focus of this lens. Instead, we've just got a small waist, a smaller waist. So specifically, what we're looking at here is um, a beam coming in with a complex radius of curvature Q1 and some uh, Rayleigh range ZR. It's also got a beam waist W0, which is um, quite large uh, compared to the lens. And what I've shown here is a beam whose waist or planar wave fronts are just on the entrance surface of that lens. So there's not much convergence or divergence of the beam going in. What happens? Well, we transform that to a complex radius of curvature Q2 with the ABCD matrix for a thin lens. And we get out a new waist, W02, and a new Rayleigh range, ZR2. We can figure out where the beam comes to a focus. And that delta Z, the distance between the lens and the new waist of the beam, is F times some stuff. Mostly, it looks like F. It's not very far from F. Let's figure out how far it is from F. So the bit that's changing the uh, focus position from just the focal length is this factor here. This factor is close to unity when F on ZR is small or vanishing. That's when the Rayleigh range of the incident beam, ZR, is much bigger than the focal length. And this is actually what I've drawn here. The characteristic length scale over which the incident beam changes is ZR. And you can see that, in, in my case, I've drawn planar wave fronts that don't really diverge or converge much over the scale of this slide. So I can pretty safely say that ZR is much, much bigger than this slide. The focal length, however, is about a quarter of the slide size. 
So I know that f on zr is a very small number, and I'm pretty much going to get the beam coming to a focus at one focal length away from the lens. We can also figure out the spot size. Here it is represented as a ratio of the spot size at the focus waist compared to the incident spot size uh, at the lens surface. We see that it's also dependent only on the Rayleigh range, the incident Rayleigh range and the focal length. So it's quite a nice expression. It only depends on those two things. And again, we can ask what physics is in this expression. Turns out there's heaps of physics in this expression. If you're doing optical lithography, say of microchips, you're trying to push Moore's law forward, or at least uh, make sure we don't violate it, you want to be able to focus a laser beam down to as small as possible to engineer these nanostructures that keep the number of elements in a certain area going up and up and up. How can you do that? How can you make W02 much, much smaller than anything else in this picture? Well, for a given focal length, you need to make um, the uh, incident Rayleigh range bigger. So you need to make this factor really big now. Again, if we made ZR bigger, we'd make the characteristic size over which the incident beam changes much bigger, but we'd also do something else. We'd make the incident waist bigger too. This means we'd need a bigger lens to uh, focus this light down to a point. So you need to capture more light uh, with a, a bigger diameter lens for a fixed focal length if you want to make the spot size smaller and smaller. This resembles the Raleigh criteria of classical optics, which you may have studied in first year, to do with resolving power of any optical system, be it a camera when you're considering things like numerical aperture, or a telescope where you're trying to resolve the smaller structures. If you want to resolve a smaller feature in your focal plane, you need to have a bigger collector, a bigger diameter lens. The second uh, and final thing we're going to talk about for Gaussian beams is what they do in cavities. So far we've just considered their propagation through free space, but now that we know how to transform one complex radius of curvature to another, we can figure out what happens when a Gaussian beam meets a mirror. Here are two mirrors uh, with potentially different radii of curvature and potentially different waist sizes when the beam hits these two mirrors. Uh, that's enough to describe the problem if I know the cavity length L. I can ask what the stability criterion is. Much like the ray theory, it's colloquially when the beam reflects back on itself. That was what got us a long way when considering the stability of rays in optical cavities. But the definition of this mathematically is very, very different. So here, rather than requiring the ray to be equal to itself after some number of round trips, we instead demand that the wavefront radii match the mirror radii. Just, just what I've drawn in this picture. I've drawn a case where the wavefront radii, the red lines at the mirror, match the mirror surface. That is to say that the phase of the wavefront is constant across the mirror surface. And you can show that this is consistent with the um, criteria for stability using the ABCD rule. Uh, you'll be happy to know that this isn't um, accessible. Warning, non-accessible material detected. And of course, I've committed the sin of telling you that it's um, not accessible. So just for a moment, we'll digress into this non-accessible content and we'll figure out how to actually define this um, stability criterion. We've got three equations. This is demanding that the radii of curvature uh, at the left-hand side equal the mirror curvature. This demands that the radii of curvature at the right-hand side equals the mirror curvature. And this is just a constraint on the system because Z2 and Z1 are not completely independent. The cavity length is fixed. So we can solve these three equations for Z1 and Z2 in terms of the physical parameters of the system, the things that we're specifying at the start, the mirror shapes and their separation. We know there's two useful numbers to reduce this into, two dimensionless parameters, the G parameters, G1 and G2, which we can also express Z1 and Z2 in terms of. Then we just have to find the beam size at the left and right mirror, which we can do by uh, figuring out the beam size in terms of that analytic function, W of Z. And then we demand that the spot sizes be real. If you go through the maths of this problem, you can have cases where the waste is an imaginary number. We stipulated from the outset that the waste must be a real number. It describes the physical size of the beam. So if we get spot sizes that aren't real, then those results are not physical. Remarkably, it gives us this criterion, that the product of G1 and G2 must be between 0 and 1. What's staggering about this is it's the exact same criterion that we got using ray optics. 
The mathematics was extremely different. The whole foundation of what we did was extremely different, but we end up with the same stability criterion. And this is just another result that speaks of the depth between the equivalence of ray and wave optics, uh, despite the absurdities. <clears throat> There's a uh, simulation on Moodle, which allows you to play with this. You can change the cavity length, the position of the waist, and the waist size. Uh, for any given cavity, you can match the radii of curvature of a Gaussian beam to the mirrors by doing two things, changing the waist size and shifting the waist position left and right, and you will always have a unique solution where the Gaussian beam is stable. Non-accessible material completed. So that's a wake-up call for those of you that uh, fell asleep during that section. So what have we done with Gaussian beams and ray optics? Well, so far we've figured out how rays propagate through free space and what conditions a mirror will produce stable oscillations. We've also looked at the um, amplitude profile and found it to be uh, a Gaussian spot which we can shine at things like doors. What haven't we considered? Well, we haven't considered frequency. So far, rays and wave optics have been considered from a purely geometric point of view. We've just said how the beam shape changes, what the wave fronts look like, and when rays map back onto themselves. That's got nothing to do with colour or frequency. And that's going to be what we're studying for the next topic of the course. So this is the thin film interference that you've probably come to know and love uh, from high school physics and first year. I'm going to show you some hallmark examples of this. Here is the um, thin film interference of an oil slick on a road. There's also thin film interference uh, in a CD layer. What are we looking at here? What kind of shell? Seashell, more specific. Mother of Pell, not quite. Abalone, yep. It turns out to be an Australian abalone. Um, I'm not sure why this is from a New Zealand website, but that's an Australian abalone giving us this thin film uh, interference and a case of iridescence as well. Here's one of my favourite examples, soap bubbles. These form one act of my origin story, and this example is a beautiful illustration of the colours of thin film interference from a soap bubble. In this case, what's causing that change in colour, do you think? The thickness, yeah. The thickness of this soap bubble is changing, probably due to gravity, and that's changing the interference pattern we're getting and the colours we're seeing. It's very cool. Here's another soap bubble. And here's the biggest soap bubble I could find on the internet. Uh, this one is quite staggering. What's impressive about this isn't the app apparatus. The apparatus is quite easy to build, and you can try a smaller version or one of these for yourself. The really important thing to get right here is the bubble mix. This makes or breaks, pardon the pun, uh, this demonstration, and getting a bubble mix right is, is quite an achievement. Now, we're going to ask ourselves a few questions about this. Actually, I'm going to ask you question one, and you're going to answer it for me. Um, how does thin film interference work? That much you should know uh, from your previous studies. Stuff you haven't touched on before, though, is why the colours go from purple to green to purple again. We'll try and address that today. And why doesn't this look like a rainbow? Put your hands up if you think that this is just a rainbow pattern. Good. Maybe a few of you. Just look at it. There's heaps of colours in there that you don't see in a rainbow. There's heaps of colours in a rainbow that you don't see in that picture. Soap bubbles are not rainbows. If you learn one thing from this course, let it be that. So now I'd like you to um, answer question one. Um, draw a diagram. Make sure the diagram has two surfaces. And you can use lines that represent rays or squiggly lines to represent waves, if you like, and explain to your partner uh, how thin film interference works. <laughs> 
Okay, now I'm going to come and uh, find out how you went. I've seen some good answers out there. These guys up here with the portable whiteboards have some good answers. Uh, can you tell me what you've got on your... Oh, you rubbed it out! Yeah. Why'd you rub it out for? Draw it again. This one looks good too. So, what have you guys have to say about um, thin film interference? No, you, well, you oh, did most of the talking. Oh god, alright. So, there's a bit of a sketch here, I guess. Yep. So you can see it. Um, there's, there's kind of like two waves. Mm -hmm. So, here's your incident wave. Yep. Part of it's going to get reflected like that, and part of it's going to get transmitted and then reflected. Awesome. Um, so, what's going to happen is there's going to be a dependence. The path difference is going to be dependent on that thickness there. Yep. Um, and then there's the phase shift there, but that's not that important at the moment. Um, so what? So, but basically, the takeaway message is that it's very dependent on that specific length. Because if that changes only slightly, then the waves that are constructively interfere will be different. So it will give a different color. And this is also why it's called thin film interference. Because if this is much much thicker than the wavelengths that light usually operates at, then you won't see this. You won't see this interference. It's not going to. It's not going to come out because that's much much bigger. Do you want to do the mic drop? Go on, cut the mic. Now drop it. What am I doing here? This guy's got it, got it sussed. Who else has got an explanation that I'd like to share? You rubbed yours out? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Here's another one. Um, I don't really have much else to add. Um, he pretty much explained everything, but my thought process was pretty much the same. You, uh, when light reaches the boundary, some of it is reflected, and some of it gets transmitted, and then gets reflected at the next boundary. And basically, the type of interference that you get depends on the thickness. Fantastic. Those are great explanations. The best I've heard. And uh, for your troubles, you guys are going to get some bubbles. So, you get bubbles, and you get bubbles. Yes. yes. And anyone else that can catch these gets bubbles too. All right, so it depends on a couple of things. It depends on the color of the light, the angle it's coming in at, and the thickness of the film. That much was clear from your, um, from your fantastic explanations. Uh, that's pretty much as far as you may have got in first year. We're going to make this a lot more precise now. So we are going to um, uh, look at the context of thin film interference in the exact way that you said. We're going to draw two parallel surfaces and rays in between them, and we're going to look at the path length difference or relative phase between those rays. In this case, we drew the problem in terms of ray optics, but of course, interference is a wave phenomena. So here is another explanation. Genius waves get cancelled out by the... Uh... <coughs> Let's try that again. The genius waves get cancelled out by the... Uh... <coughs> Morty waves. Um... So although we've drawn this in terms of ray optics, now we're really starting to see these two theories collide because while we're evaluating path length differences using ray optics, we're actually caring about phase shifts of wave fronts, which is entirely a wave optic phenomena. So if that makes your head explode, it should because we're kind of banging together these two theories now. All right, things that you might not be able to answer straight away is why the colors go from purple to green to purple again and also why this doesn't look like a rainbow. Let's try and answer question two. So indeed, we have to figure out the path length difference using some geometry. And this is something you'll have to do on your assignment. I assure you it's very character building. The path length difference is a function of the refractive indices, the angle of incidence, or the angle of refraction, either, either one, and um, the, uh, the distance between these two films. Notice how we've started talking about thin film interference, whereas so far we've been talking about cavities. This might seem like a, a bit of a jarring shift, but actually, the physics is exactly the same. We've just got two surfaces right next to each other, separated by a certain distance, and they've got some partial transmission or reflectivity. A thin film is just an optical cavity. The only difference is that the refractive index inside might be different. So that don't find this a jarring change, and do notice that these are exactly the same thing. You'll have to show in your assignment that the um, relative phase between adjacent transmitted or reflected rays, due to the path length difference, uh, is equal to this expression here. Equations are machines with dials. So let's take a look at this expression and see what the dials are. 4 pi, can't change that. Lambda, yes. The path length difference, or well, the relative phase, depends on colour. It also depends on the refractive index inside the medium. The separation of the um, two uh, film surfaces 
and the angle of incidence or angle of refraction, whichever one you like, they are related via Snell's law. So we're now going to use this um, to figure out uh, how we can actually simulate those colours and see whether we can answer question two. We're going to take a really simple approach and, uh, in describing this thin film interference. So we had this expression for the phase shift. And we're going to make a first simplification, which is to say that um, we're considering uh, a refractive index of 1, and we're considering normal incidence as well. So this just becomes 4 pi on lambda times d. To do this problem properly, we'd have to account for the fact that different wavelengths can interfere differently, and that's too hard for our very uh, first principles toy model approach. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to say that only one wavelength gets through this film for a specific film thickness. We're going to call that wavelength lambda res. So lambda res is going to be defined uh, by the following equation. When the phase shift is equal to some integer multiple of, uh, of 2 pi. So 2 pi m. Uh, is equal to 4 pi on lambda times d. Uh, we can solve for um, the, the resonant transmitted wavelength. It becomes a 2. And we find that um, the resonant transmitted wavelength, again, this is a very simple view of interference. And that's going to equal to uh, 2d on m where m is the order of the interference. If I get multiple uh, values of 2 pi, multiple wavelengths being um, the relative value between uh, these two waves that are coming together. Again, this is not how interference works. It's just a very simple toy model. Uh, but we'll see how far we can get uh, using this expression. So we're going to do a, a simulation now of this, um, of this soap bubble using this fact. And um, the first thing we're going to do is define uh, that phase shift. It's going to be a function of lambda, d, and remember, I want the um, refractive index and angle of incidence to have these default values of 1 and 0. Now, there's no sleight of hand here. This preliminary section is just some plotting options, so we really are starting from a blank slate. I also need some physical constants, or at least some SI prefixes, nanometers, micrometers, and millimeters, because we're going to try and put numbers in uh, at the end of this. So that's minus 9, minus 6, and minus 3. Just those three numbers. We now need to um, figure out how we're going to represent color on our computer screen. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to use a Mathematica bar legend. This is just some crude representation of the colors of a rainbow, and it's going to be the color scheme we use for all of our plots uh, in this simulation. So now we have to, um, you know, see what we can do to pull these colors out one by one. I'm going to use um, color data uh, using the rainbow color scheme. And you'll see that I can put a number in here. Zero gives me roughly purple. Purple's not on a rainbow. We'll get to that. I can also um, pull out the value at one, which is red. So I've got a machine now which will give me a color for a particular um, number between zero and one. Of course, I like to... Um, have that turn into a machine. So I'm going to actually take this expression, stick an x there, and make x go from 0 to 1. And I get a color slider, which indeed changes as x goes from 0 to 1. Great. None of the physics in our problem has numbers that go from 0 to 1. Instead, we've got wavelengths. So we're going to now take um, our variable uh, x and find a way to map to it um, by using the fact that um, we can just map wavelengths in the visible spectrum um, to x. So let's find out what x solution is in terms of lambda. Uh, it's going to take some parameters as well, like uh, the initial wavelength, which will make 400 nanometers, and also the, um, change, the range of wavelengths we want to represent color over. Let's make that 600 nanometers. And this is going to be lambda minus the initial value divided by um, delta lambda. So does this work? Let's find out what x-sol is for 400 nanometers. It's zero. That's good. What is it for 600 nanometers? 
If it's one third, that's not good. Oops, that should be 200 nanometers, the delta. And it's one. I can actually plot this if I plot the wavelength for lambda in nanometers now, because I want the numbers on the x-axis to go from um, uh, 400 to 600. We should see this mapping very clearly. So when wavelength goes from 400 nanometers to, to 600 nanometers, this number x goes from 0 to 1. And let's just label the axes so we're extremely clear on what we're talking about. It's got arbitrary units. Of course, this doesn't really keep track of that rainbow uh, color scheme. So let's put in the rainbow again. There we go. So this is what we're going to use. This isn't the thin film interference yet. This is just our mapping from wavelength to some number that generates a color. Now we're going to actually put the physics of thin film interference in by defining that um, resonant wavelength lambda res. So lambda res, what was that a function of? It was a function of d and also m. Let's consider three wavelengths of interference here. And it was 2d over m. Really simple. So that maps us from, um, from wavelength to distance. Now we're going to try and generate this gradient we've, we've sought the whole time, which is the color, resonant color as a function of film thickness. So let's give that a go. We're going to plot um, uh, lambda res as a function of d. And we're going to make um, d to be in microns. So we get a nice number between, I don't know, 0 and 1. Let's make it go from 0.3 microns to 0.6 microns. And we have to make sure that we're including all the numbers in our plot. And I'm going to divide that by nanometers just so I get nice numbers on the vertical axis. So indeed, um, in this case, I've got the, uh, the wavelength going from, um, let's make that 6 actually, uh, maybe even less. I could make this go from 0.6 to 1.2. Okay, so now I've got a, a wavelength that goes from like 400 nanometers, um, maybe I'll make it go to 0.9. Up to 0.9 microns, the wavelength changes over the range we want. Again, I've got to try and make this have the color scheme that I want, so I'm going to change the color function now. I can't just say it's rainbow, because rainbow will take the numbers uh, on the vertical axis. Instead, I've got to map those numbers back to x which uh, has units which are nothing, and it varies between 0 and 1. So x sol percent 2 should do that. Uh, not quite. Color data, I've got to specify rainbow. And I also have to put um, the nanometers back in. Cool. So now we have the relationship between uh, the film thickness and the resonant wavelength plotted. And we're kind of doing this nice thing of keeping track of what that resonant wavelength looks like. So this is d in microns and uh, lambda res in nanometers. OK. Now we actually want to plot something which is just a picture of physical space. We want to see some film with a variable thickness and the color change underneath it. So for starters, we need to specify a function of space that has a variable film thickness. And I'm going to um, uh, do that by just plotting some made-up function that looks like um, uh, d naught plus uh, 0.5 delta d. Um, it's going to be oscillatory uh, as a function of some other spatial variable. He's going to go from like uh, 0 to 10 pi, so we get uh, five oscillations of this wiggly film thickness. And now, of course, I've got to tell Mathematica what the values for this initial film thickness are. Um, I want to make uh, d naught go from 0.3 up to... 0.9, and delta D, let's make that 0 up to 0.3. Okay, so here is now some variable film thickness, uh, and I'm going to see what the effect of adding in some oscillation to it is. Just to remind you of what you're looking at, the film thickness is now on the vertical axis. All right, so I'm going to make the overall film thickness change. That just makes it thicker. And I can also change how much it varies in the undulation. Again, I haven't kept track of the, um, of the color now, so I want to put that back in. I want to put in my color function. And I need to uh, figure out 
how to get the wavelength back in. So first I'm going to use color data for the rainbow color scheme. And I need to pass that a number between 0 and 1. It's going to be x sol of lambda res of d, which is this function here, which I can just actually specify as percent 2, the y element of that plot. Count the square brackets. I've got 1, 2, 3 going in. I need a third one going out. Ampersand to evaluate that. And I should have something which makes sense now. Um, so I also have to specify that this is in microns. Starts off as purple. Change the film thickness, see what happens. I get a different colour passing through the bubble. Right? So far, so good. Now let's make this undulate as a function of space. There, that's, what we, that's what we're seeking. So now we've got this very simple model which shows us that we can have a resonant wavelength transmitted or reflected as we vary the film thickness across space, in this case in an oscillatory fashion. And indeed, I was trying to answer that question too, how can I get the colours going from blue through to purple and back to blue again? And with this very, very basic model, uh, treating interference as a dichotomy, I indeed get that phenomenon uh, precisely. Not so precisely, but uh, close enough for a page of Mathematica. All right. So, that's better. If we're going to calculate this phase shift accurately, we need to know something about how the waves or how the rays interact with these two surfaces. And this, is, um, this demands that we know exactly how the coefficients of transmission and reflection are related to each other on either side of the surface and what phase shifts the light picks up as it goes through these surfaces. Um, one of the answers up there hinted at this phase shift, and we're going to figure out what it is now. So this is a picture of some light entering a medium. It goes from N1 to N2. A couple of familiar things happen. I get reflection, so I've got theta1 or theta i equaling theta i, the angle of incidence equaling the angle of reflection. And I've got some refraction as well, theta2. And I've got three rays drawn here, the, the incident ray, the reflected ray, and the transmitted ray. I can run this picture in reverse. It's physics. I can demand time reversal invariance. This isn't anything exotic like uh, time reversal breaking. This should work. This picture should be able to be played backwards uh, just like Newtonian mechanics. What's weird about this picture though, if I've got the ray coming in from the, from the right here, bouncing off the surface to give that one, what's a bit strange now? What's that? It's splitting, yeah, but it's not even splitting in a, in a kind of uh, physically nice way. It's kind of splitting down there. But actually, the arrowhead has been reversed on all these vectors, so it's not splitting. It's got a, a beam coming up here. But there's still a few things missing. What are they? Yep. Nothing is transmitted back into the medium. That's right. Um, this beam should have a transmitted component. What else is missing? Yep, this one should have a reflected component as well. So when we run this simulation or picture backwards, uh, there's some weirdness. But this has to work. We have to have the physics of this situation working because nothing says in at least the ray or wave optics theory that time can't go backwards. So what's happening? Well, it's just the fact that these things are adding up in a funny way to give us uh, different values. So let's take a look at um, what demanding time reversal invariance means uh, for this picture. I'm going to have to do it in one note because it seems to be um, uh, not working so well. So I've got some uh, surface, which I'll redraw. I've got N1 and N2. And I've got a ray coming in when I run that simulation in reverse with amplitude E0 I times R. That R is the reflection, the amplitude coefficient of reflection. I also had this ray coming back up to the surface, which was the forward going transmitted ray, its amplitude was E0 I times T, where T is the amplitude coefficient of transmission going from N1 to N2. And of course I had that, um, that incident ray to start off with, which was E0 I. So this is that schematic drawn in reverse, so time has been reversed. Well we also have these um, phantom rays that we knew are there but they weren't drawn. This one has an amplitude of E0 I T and I'm going to times it by another coefficient, 
I'm going to times it by the reflection coefficient inside the medium, R prime. Why have I stuck a prime on it? Well, in general, the reflection coefficient inside the medium is going to differ to the reflection coefficient outside the medium going from N1 to N2 is different from going to N2 to N1, not least because the angles might be different as well. I've got the other ray, which was the um, transmitted ray from the beam going up. I'll actually draw that in a different colour. So that's E naught I T. What do I have to times that by? I have to times that by the transmission coefficient uh, T prime, going from N2 to N1. And there is one more ray that I haven't drawn, and that's the reflected component of the, um, the incident beam in this, this description. So that is going to be E naught I R squared. You just pick up another reflection coefficient on the way back. Now, the physics of this problem allows us to write down some equations. Let's consider the reflection on the top of the surface first and demand that it equal what we started with, E naught I. That means that we're going to have E naught I times R squared plus this transmitted bit. Whoops, it's not T squared, it's T prime. What does that have to equal? It has to equal the incident beam amplitude for the forward going diagram. That's our first equation. Our second equation has to do with um, on the other side of the interface. So we know that E naught I T R prime, when we add that to E naught I T, we're going to get what? Oh, we also have a, a, another one. I'm sorry. I've forgotten to draw a fourth missing ray, which is, let's choose purple, the transmitted one uh, from up here. That's going to have amplitude E naught I R times the transmission coefficient. Good. So if we're going to make this forward going diagram be consistent with the backwards going diagram, these rays have to sum to zero. That's why there's no ray in the bottom left of this diagram. We can notice that there's heaps of common factors of E naught I here. Replace that with one. And we get some pretty simple expressions relating the transmission and reflection coefficients on either side of the surface. The first one is R squared plus the product of the two transmission coefficients is equal to one. And the second one is noting that the transmission coefficients cancel as well. This one relates the two amplitude coefficients of reflection. And these are known as the Stokes relations. Ah, yeah, absolutely, thank you. So these um, two very powerful results came from drawing a diagram, demanding that physics work in reverse and making that statement consistent. So here are the results put in a more explicit form, noting that not only are these two transmission and reflection coefficients dependent on whether you're going from one side of the surface to the other, but they're also going to depend on angle, uh, given theta 1 and theta 2 are not necessarily the same, or they're definitely not the same. So you can read more about this and the Stokes treatment of reflection and refraction in, in HECT. But now we're ready to do the full problem, to consider multiple beam interference. So here's the, the setup. We've got some incident beam with um, amplitude E naught, uh, two refractive indices in general, two surfaces separated by D, and there's the first reflection and the first transmission. We then consider an infinite number of these. This is where things become really different from what you've studied before. We're not just considering the interference of two beams, we're considering the interference of an infinite number of beams. Hello. Each time you go through the surface, you pick up one amplitude coefficient of transmission. Each time you reflect off the surface, you pick up one amplitude coefficient of reflection. So for each of these rays, 
we can write down what the amplitude is, not considering the phase shifts, but we can write down the amplitude based on these four numbers, t, t prime, r and r prime. And we also note that r and r prime are just equal to each other with a negative sign. So, why is this useful? Well, we can put this into the fact that um, the optical path length difference between adjacent transmitted or reflected rays can be written down like that. The relative phase is related to that um, optical path length difference plus some phase that you pick up for each reflection. And we can find out the total transmitted amplitude. So we've written down the amplitude and phase of all the transmitted bits. And we're just asking the question now, if we shine light in with amplitude E0 on this side of the film, what's going to come out? It's going to be the sum of all these amplitudes. They're all less than E0, <coughs> but we get to add up an infinite number of these uh, transmitted electric field amplitudes. This is nothing other than a geometric series, and it's uh, a great example of how the infinite is tractable in physics. So it might not seem like if we drew this diagram that goes on forever and ever, we're going to get anything physical, but it is a perfect example of that. It's also an example of, um, as Bertrand Russell called it, turtles all the way down. I've depicted Bertrand Russell by Richard Feynman here. And these infinities are related to the infinities you encounter all the time in physics, like those in Feynman diagrams. And because the internet is the internet, we also know that um, anything is a cat, so Feynman diagrams can be drawn uh, in a way that dep depicts a cat which uh, confers to rule 17 or another one of the internet, which is that one cat leads to another. And in that vein, we can draw a Feynman diagram of, um, of keyboard cats um, and it's turtles all the way down. <laughs>